All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming in such a short uh, time frame, but we appreciate it, uh, you as well as the staff for making this happen. Let me just introduce uh, Mark because we've got a lot to get to and I'm just going to get out of the way. So Mark Danner has written about foreign affairs and American politics for more than two decades, covering Latin America, Haiti, the Balkans, and the Middle East, among other stories. He was for many years as a staff writer at The New Yorker and contributes frequently to the New York Review of Books, the New York Times magazines, and other publications. He teaches at the University of California at Bard College and speaks and debates widely about America's role in the world. Thank you for your time, Mark. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Francisco. And thank you, Freddie. There, this was their idea, and we got it together very, very quickly. I'm really happy you guys are here. And I thank Julie as well uh, and Rick for organizing uh, the Zoom. Uh, we, I gather we have some people watching and we are recording it. So um, there's a lot to get to. There's a lot of detail here when you start talking, hello. <laughs> uh, and even younger people are interested. Uh, there's a lot of detail when we start talking about uh, this war, particularly historical detail, but I wanna leave uh, uh, enough time for questions, any questions that you have, and any uh, discussion. I hope we can have a discussion. Um, yesterday was a cataclysmic date. Um, uh, sometimes it's obvious, like Pearl Harbor or uh, September 11th. Sometimes it kind of creeps up on you. And I think this is one of those cataclysmic dates that's kind of crept up on us. Um, this will change the world in quite a dramatic way. It will change Europe, and it also is very likely uh, to change the United States. It is the beginning of probably quite a long uh, conflict that will alter the way the United States sees itself in the world, and that will alter, in I think probably pretty fundamental ways, American foreign policy. Um, yesterday, war began. Uh, the latest casualty figures on Ukrainians is 137 dead. That's yesterday. We don't yet know about today. Uh, the Ukrainians are estimating that 800 Russians were killed, a disparity that comes very much, as journalists know, depending on who your sources are. So the, that, that source is uh, the current Ukrainian government, 800 or so Russians dead, 137 Ukrainians. We don't have the casualty figures for today yet, uh, but I'm sure we'll see them soon. Um, a lot of people are uh, dying and are going to die. You've seen, if you've been watching CNN, scenes of Ukrainians packed into subway stations uh, for shelter from the bombing in the capital of Kiev, in Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city, and elsewhere around the country. Early reports on where the Russians actually are are by definition unreliable at this point. We're at a very early stage of the conflict in which essentially the Russians are using airborne forces to seize uh, certain targets. Uh, it's called a coup de main, a, a blow of the hand. They're using airborne forces, for example, to seize the Antonov uh, airport outside of the capital of Kiev. Uh, they've been visible in several other spots and we're starting to get uh, the advanced elements of an invasion. Um, I wanted to start with this map, which is the latest news on military dispensation the explosions are simply showing airstrikes, usually mostly with uh, cruise missiles and rockets. So long range munitions um, increasingly, increasingly we'll be seeing the use of artillery uh, as is being used right now in uh, the so-called Donbass region. This region, uh, as you'll see the Luhansk and Donetsk which are shown there with stripes, the yellow and white stripes, that's the separatist areas that have been occupied. And I'll go into the background of this in a minute uh, by Russian sympathetic Ukrainians. Uh, this war began with Vladimir Putin first declaring 
his recognition and Russia's recognition of the Donbass as a separate state, as an independent state. He has done that also in Georgia. He's in effect done it in Moldova. This is what is called creating frozen conflicts. It makes it impossible, for example, and again, we'll get to this in a minute, for a state to join NATO. In order to join NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, you have to have control of all your territory. If you do not, if part of it is occupied by a foreign power or by separatist forces, then you cannot join NATO. So it immediately makes a fact on the ground that uh, this is where the Russian uh, sympathetic forces have occupied and have been fighting since 2014. This larger area is the area that is now claimed to be independent by Russia. And as you see, Russian forces are coming in. That's where you have Russian forces right there in pink. And you have them there and there and there and there and down here. Uh, Crimea has been occupied by Russia since 2014. They have claimed to annex it. Okay. Let's show a little bit, uh, a brief video here of what's going on. As you imagine, there are a lot of YouTube. <laughs> uh the next one this is over a suburb of kiev the capital you see the burning as a result of long range missions you see russian airborne forces perhaps these are the ones that the uh, airport um, okay let's go back to the original map for a second and you see, basically, we've got uh, Russian troop dispositions all around Ukraine's borders, uh, except for the border with Poland and Romania over here. Um, and these forces can be expected to move in. Kharkiv, the second largest city, is already um, in some form occupied. It's unclear how many Russians are there, but there are Russians there. Mariupol, also quite a large city, a port city next to the Donbass, is in some form occupied. And here you have forces coming up from the Crimea. So in a sense, uh, Ukraine is being crushed in between forces coming from almost all, from almost every border, except for Poland, which is where the refugees are going. So you have at least 50,000 refugees who have already left over that border. Poland is, has been anticipating th this. It's welcoming them. Most of those people are expecting to come back in the near future. I mean, a refugee's life is by definition uncertain. So whether that happens or not, we don't know. Uh, the president of Ukraine has ordered that no male ages 18 to 60 can leave the country. Anybody speculate why that is? The military, right? They're, they're as Francisco says, they're, this is military age males. They're anticipating a long fight, possibly an insurgency of the kind that the US battled in Iraq. You remember imp improvised explosive devices, attacks by snipers, irregular warfare. That phase of the conflict will ensue, presumably, once the Russians actually occupy the city. So right now, we're, we're very much at the beginning. And what we can assume in coming days is they will probably occupy Kiev. Forces are coming down from Belorussia, where the Russians were having joint military exercises with the Belorussians, uh, which was a cover for preparing for this invasion. They were supposed to go home, they didn't. Now they are coming down from the north and presume they already have the airport. So presumably, which as I say, was taken by airborne troops. They also have the uh, special area around Chernobyl. They have occupied and they are holding the staff hostage. 
at that place. Um, that's, as you know, a kind of isolated zone because of the high radi radioactivity because of the accidents there. Um, uh, but we can anticipate in coming days that Kiev will be occupied. Um, and we should get more news. I mean, there are a lot of Western report, a lot of reporters in Kiev. We should get news of that. Who knows whether they'll be thrown out. Um, you obviously now have reporters in Mariupol. Uh, you have reporters in Kharkiv. And basically, reporters now have to decide, where should I go? What is the freedom of movement going to be? How is where I am going to be affected by the movement of Russian troops? Where can I report most profitably while not getting captured? Uh, I don't know if anybody here saw some startling CNN footage this morning that CNN's Matthew Chance went out with a film crew to the airport because they had been told some tip came in that there was a clash at the airport between the Russian airborne forces and Ukrainians and that the Ukrainians won and kicked the Russians out. So off they went to the airport, great story. We're gonna to talk to the Ukrainians, victorious Ukrainians at the airport. They started to interview them. They, they said in a priceless passage, I should show it here, but we, we couldn't find it on short notice. Um, where are the Russians, where are the Russians? And these soldiers looked very bewildered where are the Russians? Where are the Russians? And finally, one said, Ya Ruski, Ya Ruski, I'm Russian, I'm Russian. And it turns out that actually the Russians won. And the Russians were in control of the airport. And CNN was a little bit distressed in hearing that. It, it shows the kind of things that happened reporting during wartime. I mean, basically, you are it, you are discovering what is going on, and your safety is on the line. And uh, you take, by definition, you take risks, um, but presumably you don't take stupid risks. The one thing that they, you don't want them to say about you after something terrible has happened was, gee, he was really stupid. You want, you want to do things that seem at least at the time to be warranted uh, and that have a low enough risk that, that you should be doing them. All right, um, I'm loath to go into too much history here, but the fact is, Understanding what's going on here is impossible without understanding the history of basically back to World War II. Um, and I'm gonna keep this, we're gonna do this with maps. Let's, let's shift to the um, uh, Nazi occupied Europe, okay? The Germans, you notice that the rhetoric that the Russians are using, particularly Vladimir Putin, he's saying we're gonna denazify Ukraine. What, what does that mean, right? But in fact, this conflict has deep historical resonance for everyone who's involved in it. And you can't really understand it without knowing about the geography and the history. And we're gonna to try to go through it quickly. There's gonna be questions afterwards. If you don't understand something, don't be shy about it, okay? Um, Nazis, the Nazi regime occupying Europe in 1942, right? They controlled it all. Spain was ruled by Franco an aligned uh, uh, dictator, um, but uh, Mussolini was in Italy and they controlled the entire country. They eventually invaded uh, the, the then Soviet Union in this enormous invasion, Operation Barbarossa, and were stopped literally at the gates of Moscow and at the gates, by the way, of Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. Hundreds of thousands of people in those cities died of starvation. 20 million Russians died, 20 million. It's like an astonishing number, yeah. I'm sorry? I mean that uh, um, lots of uh, former uh, Soviet Union people died, not just Russians. Oh, absolutely. I'm from Kazakhstan. No, no, yeah. you're, quite, you're quite right. Excuse me. I was using a, 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 the current term of art, but you're absolutely right. People from all over the Soviet Union, which is a multi, multilingual, multi-ethnic empire, in effect. And, you know, Kazakhs died, Ukrainians died, um, uh, Moldovans died. When I say that, you, I should say people from the Soviet Union, you're absolutely right. And uh, that is true. And the numbers were absolutely horrendous. Uh, nothing like them. I mean, the only 
numbers that are close are Germans. You know, vast numbers uh, died in this war. It was tremendously, tremendously destructive. Uh, it's, it's kind of hard to cope with how destructive it was. All of you have seen uh, black and white film for Berlin, from Berlin after the war when Allied bombing, which is US and uh, uh, British bombing mostly, had absolutely wiped the city out while well, whole parts of uh, the Soviet Union looked like that. So let's go back to um, uh, back several maps. Okay, that's, that's where Ukraine is, of course. Um, let's do the Warsaw Pact. Warsaw Pact. Okay, basically this is to cut through a lot of history. This is the line that the Red Army reached at the end of World War II. So we had the Americans invaded, right? The famous invasion on the Normandy beaches that we hear so much about. At the same time, uh, the Soviet Red Army under Stalin, Joseph Stalin, was pushing in the other direction, back into Europe. And uh, the two armies essentially met here. And what ensued was a division of Europe that lasted 40 years, more than that. Europe was divided. You've heard about the Iron Curtain. Well, Europe was divided along the Iron Curtain, and it looked like this. Uh, on this side is what became NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. On this side is the Warsaw Pact. And the Warsaw Pact was essentially made up of countries that finished the war occupied by Russian or by Soviet troops. Okay, now an interesting thing here is where's Ukraine? not even shown on the map because it is part of the Soviet Union. It is one of the Soviet socialistic republics. So it's down here, right? Right there, but it isn't even uh, shown. Let's take a look at uh, the NATO maps. I think it's back, yeah. Okay, so basically what did the United States do to deal with the so-called Soviet menace. Okay, we can argue about how great that menace was in the late 40s, but the response to it, the idea that the Soviet Union might keep invading Europe or might at least induce countries in Europe to become communists. There were huge communist parties in France and in Italy that were on the verge of victory through democratic means. Again, this is very dense history. The United States and its allies formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And the point of it, as you can see by this map, was essentially to join North America, the United States and Canada, to Europe. In other words, to balance the Soviet Union and all of its forces with the combined forces of North America and Europe. And NATO persists to this day. But you have to, to understand what's going now, you have to understand uh, this history. So let's go to the next one. Um, okay, so here we have the map from basically 1945 to 1989. Okay, notice Poland, East Germany, Germany is divided right down the center, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, all are what might be called buffer states on the border of the Soviet Union. And when we ask, where's Ukraine? There it is, right, right there. There's the Crimea Peninsula, right there, where the Soviets had a major naval base and where not coincidentally, they just annexed that in 2014. They said, all right, you guys, you Ukrainians are gonna kick out the Russian sympathetic leader, which is what happened in 2014, we are gonna take Crimea. We're gonna seize it. And that's what they did. Okay, next map. All right, now 
what started happening 1989, you had the Berlin Wall collapse. You had this movement of freedom across Eastern Europe, the so-called Velvet Revolutions. I realize this is be before all your, your time, but I remember it very most vividly. The destruction of the wall, people climbing all over it, smashing pieces out of it in 1989, November 10th, my birthday, as a matter of fact. Uh, so I remember it vividly. And essentially, you had the wall, Gorbachev, then running the Soviet Union, uh, let it happen. He could have sent troops in, as he did in 1956 to Hungary, as he did in 68 to Czechoslovakia, but instead he let it happen. Uh, the Soviet power in those countries collapsed, and a process began where NATO moved east. So essentially, you had the Western alliance start to take in these countries that had been buffer lands for the Soviet Union. It was quite controversial at the time. I wrote a long essay, very long essay in 94, arguing we should not do this, that eventually there'd be a catastrophe. That uh, was a bad idea. Um, and the, the essay attracted a lot of attention. In fact, at the Council on Foreign Relations, I found myself debating the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Who was that at the time? Does anybody know? Joseph R. Biden. I have to admit, in the interest of candor, that he wiped the floor with me. He's a very good debater. He, even though I was right, he destroyed me. And I'm sure he's probably thinking about that right now. All right, see, now, basically, we have core NATO. That's black. That's 1949, right? All these countries were in it at the beginning. If this showed North America, it would show the United States and Canada, right? So that's core NATO. And then you start moving east. And you see that you have Poland, okay? Hungary, Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, as it became Slovakia. This is 1999. And then 2004, something very dramatic happened that I didn't even dream of when I wrote my essay, which is the Baltic states joined. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Now, what is the geographical, what's geographically interesting about that? They are right on the border of Russia. Now, I didn't think this would happen because they're essentially indefensible. I don't know, people may disagree about that, but it would be very hard for the United States to defend those countries. So in a sense, we're placing a kind of bet on them. And it was this, remember, you're talking about the end of the Cold War, American triumphalism, right? We're gonna move across the world, we're gonna conquer. And so the United States moved east, 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 and eventually, current aspirations to join. What's that? And this? Georgia. So where the US, where the Soviet, or excuse me, the Russians have also invaded in 2014, or excuse me, 2008, and took a chunk. So that's another frozen conflict. So from the Russian point of view, they are responding to NATO's aggression. I'm not saying I agree with that, but I'm saying it is not a ridiculous contention. It has a certain degree of truth. NATO's response is aggression. Nobody's gonna attack you. I mean, the Ukrainians are not gonna invade you, which is by the way, what the Russians have been saying, that this war is a response to a threat of a Ukrainian invasion. If the Ukrainians were about to invade the Donbass right there, and that uh, the Russians had to go in and rescue them. So they see it as this movement that's headed in this direction that they have to stop. If you talk to Biden or people in the US Senate, they will say, well, Ukraine has a perfect right to become a NATO member if it wants to. 
We have an open door policy. And we're not about to invade Russia. Russia replies, you've been moving toward us. You took over all these states that used to be our allies, quote unquote, right? Where we used to have troops. And now you're about to take a state that's right in, look at the geography, right in Russia. And we're not gonna let it happen. And that's why one of the main demands of Putin was, we want a statement that Ukraine will never be a member of NATO. And the, the West, the so-called West, the United States refused to give it. We have an open door policy. Uh, let's go, go forward. Um, this also shows uh, the advance and then the aspirant members here and here. But I hope this geography is revealing about what the issues are. Let's keep going. Whatever the next one is. Okay, so now we are back to, so the current history, you know, what, what you really want to remember, 2008, the conflict over Georgia, 2014, the annexation of the Crimea. 2000, the other thing to say about 2014 is there was a Russian sympathetic president of Ukraine named uh, Yanukovych, um, who basically decided there was a deal that the Ukrainians were gonna make with the West with the European community, European Union, excuse me, and who at the last minute decided under Russian pressure, no, 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 we want to stay close to Russia. There was a revolution against him, an uprising, the Maidan uprising. Does anybody remember that? It's an amazing event. And he fled. Now, to the Russians, that was an anti-Russian coup. To the Ukrainians and certainly the West, it was a freedom uprising against dictatorship. So again, completely different analyses, but 2014, the Russians responded to this by doing two things. They seized the Crimea. They did it nonviolently with so-called little green men, troops not in official Russian uniforms uh, who seized control. And they also supported separatists right here, Luhansk, Donetsk. And there has been a war going on ever since in that region uh, that has killed 1,400 Ukrainians, 1,400. So most Ukrainians think this is a heating up of a war that's been going on since 2014. And remember, one of the relevant points here is that uh, this part is controlled by the Russian sympathetic separatists. But this part has been recognized by Putin as independent. So the first thing that's going, to, one of the first things that's going to happen is presumably Russian troops right here are going to occupy this region. There's gonna be a lot of fighting there, presumably. Okay, how much time do we have? Uh, 25 minutes. Okay, so this is the current uh, play of forces, you see where the Russians are coming from, uh, and uh, they are headed, as I said at the beginning, probably the first thing that's going to happen is Kiev is going to be seized. No telling how bloody that will be, no telling how many people will die, no telling what the resistance will be. Uh, it could be very bloody or people could fade out and try to start a resistance from outside the capital. We don't know yet. The one thing we don't know is what are the plans of the Ukrainians at this point, right? We know a lot of about the dispositions of the Russians, but not so much, at least publicly, about the disposition of the Ukrainians, okay? So, but one thing the Russians have already achieved is they're gonna make it impossible for uh, Ukraine to join NATO anytime soon. It wouldn't have anyway. Uh, but by having this occupation, this broadening occupation, this frozen conflict, uh, the country will not be able to uh, join NATO at any time in the uh, visible 
or uh, uh, yeah, visible future. Uh, let's let's go on. Okay, again, those are those two areas. This is earlier the disposition of forces. We've been seeing this evolve over the last several weeks. And oddly enough, American intelligence, which has had several spectacular failures over the last 20 years, including uh, before 9-11 and before the Iraq war, big subjects uh, to talk about, um, has done pretty well thus far in predicting what was going to happen. And uh, those earlier failures are completely relevant because a number of European states were very skeptical about the US position that Putin was going to, as it were, go big, take all of Ukraine. They didn't believe American intelligence. And part of the reason is because of those earlier failures and the politicization of intelligence, particularly before the Iraq war, the use of it as a political argument. So you see the way that those, the last 20 years have weakened the United States. Uh, that's one of the ways. Uh, let's keep going. What else do we have? Uh, so there are current strikes. As I said at the beginning, this is happening with long range munitions, cruise missiles, um, uh, uh, rocket fire. Uh, this will, if, if things unfold as we would expect, uh, various airports will be seized by airborne troops. These are elite troops, uh, like Navy SEALs, the equivalent on this side, uh, on our side, as it were. Uh, they will seize airports, and then eventually you will have those entries by armored forces, by tanks. And the closest target, as you see, as I said, is Kiev, where people are coming down from Belarus uh, to seize Kiev. There are the invasion routes. Kharkiv, second largest city, as I mentioned, Donbass, Crimea, and refugee flows, if we were going to show them, are going in this direction. Okay. Uh, now, this map is interesting because it shows the country divided into two by the Dnieper River, which is the major, one of the major geographical features of Ukraine. Uh, invaders in the past tended to divide the country that way into a European West and a much and a rather more Russian East. So some analysts thought that what Russia, what Putin was going to do is basically seize this. Uh, but it seems like he has chosen as, as American intelligence predicted to go big and to perhaps decapitate the government. And that means go into Kiev, either literally decapitate it by killing the leadership uh, or at least get them out of power so that they have to go into hiding. Uh, and you've seen today, um, uh, Zelensky made a speech. Um, he's trying to rally his forces. Modern communications, YouTube and so on, have changed the game and things like this. We'll see whether they're able to knock out the internet, for example. It will be a huge advantage uh, for the Ukrainian resistance, if it's able to make use of the internet, get its footage out, get YouTube out, uh, if uh, the Western press is able to put out a lot of footage and show the fighting, uh, it'll be important because it'll show it to the West, but also because it'll show it to the Russians. One of the more interesting developments of the last two days is substantial demonstrations in Russia, anti-war demonstrations. A thousand people were arrested in Moscow. Very big deal. And if this continues, uh, you know, that could be very, very uh, important fact uh, that Putin could be uh, opposed by his own people. We'll see how strong the regime is. Right now, they're responding very harshly by arresting people. You know, they arrested everybody who stuck their head out of doors, basically. Whether they can keep doing that, whether you see the security forces stopping that. I mean, there are a lot of uh, signs that'll show us that Putin perhaps might have made a mistake uh, from his point of view and might be weakening at home. Um, let's see. Okay, here we have number of troops, 30,000, 1,000, 30,000 in Belarus. These are extremely important because they're coming down toward the capital, as I've said several times. Um, did we have another map? I'm trying to, okay. 
uh, the original, again, the strikes, remember all of these strikes are killing people. Um, Transnistria here is a breakaway part of Moldova. Also the frozen conflict that I talked about earlier, uh, which will uh, keep it out of the hands of NATO, although that didn't seem likely at any, at any point uh, in any event. Um, here's Port of Odessa, which they also may take using seaborne forces. You see down here there was a uh, conflict, a uh, uh, Russian, um, uh, I don't know what it was, a gunboat of some kind, approached Snake Island off Odessa and essentially announced over its loudspeaker, uh, Ukrainian army, Ukrainian army, lay down your arms. Um, we don't want to cause bloodshed, lay down your arms and surrender. And the Ukrainians replied, go fuck yourself or fuck you, Russian boat or something like that. Anyway, uh, so it's not the most elevated slogan for the war, but this has captured the imagination. All of those soldiers, 13 of them were killed uh, by artillery or so we're told. Uh, very often reporting at the beginning of a war turns out to be erroneous. We should keep that in mind. Um, but we are at uh, it should be emphasized at the beginning. We're not even at the end of the beginning. We're still at the beginning of the beginning. So this could go on a long time. I'm sure the Russians will want to get out quickly somehow, but whether the, that was the American plan in Iraq, I would remind you, the Americans went in in March and they were supposed to be out by, uh, I'm sorry, was it March or April? March, and they were supposed to be out by September. You know, 10 years later, you know, I mean, or eight years later. So um, one thing you can keep in mind about wars, George Kennan said this, I've quoted him several times, the great American diplomat and essentially father of con the containment policy, which was the key to the Cold War, said the thing about wars is you know, where, you know where they begin, you never know where they're gonna end. And I would, with those words of Kennan's, let me thank you for your attention and throw this open to questions of any kind. Yeah, uh, please uh, take the mic and yell. Hey, Mark, uh, thanks for this. Um, I'm curious, one of the stated goals of the Russian troops is regime change. So what, what does that, what does the Russian regime change operation look like? And how do you do that in a deeply hostile country? Like, like what do you kind of see coming down the pipeline for that? That's a really good question. Um, I think what, what they want to, you know, the vague answer is they want to put in, install a pro-Russian regime. They want to install a regime that's sympathetic to Russia, like the one that got scared away in 2014. But you're, you're, you made the key point when you said deeply hostile country. I mean, between, you know, in the eight years between 2014 and now, shoot, I had a graph, but I, maybe you can find it, that shows public opinion in Ukraine and public opinion toward Russia. And basically it's like this, and then 2014, it goes like this, disapproving. You know, it's dramatically different than it was in 2014. Ukrainians do not want to be part of Russia. I mean, there are some certainly on the, you know, all the way in the occupied areas, there are some who are sympathetic to Russia. There's no question about it. But those numbers seem to have dramatically subsided since 2014. And this invasion, obviously, when they're killing Ukrainians, is going to have a bolstering effect on that tendency. So you end up putting in a regime that's going to be deeply unpopular uh, and uh, that's going to have to preside over a counterinsurgency. And that way leads toward an, a harsh autocracy. Um, uh, whether the Russians can get out and leave the harsh, harsh autocracy, whether it's strong enough to support itself, I think is deeply questionable. You know, because they're going to probably have to leave Russian troops to support it. And, you know, they'll try to pull them back. Eventually, they'll try to pull them back from the city so you don't see them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think it's, it's going to be very hard, particularly the bloodier the war, the more people die, the more pissed off and angry the country's going to be. Uh, and I think, you know, to go, just go back to your point for one second, in situations like this, Occupying countries have a tendency to tell themselves stories. 
And I think in the top of the Kremlin, they may really be thinking, you know, we have to denazify the country, right? Denazify the country. And uh, once we get rid of these people, these Nazis and Jews, right? The current president is Jewish. Once we got rid of them, we'll be fine. They love Russia. Putin may really believe that. Uh, just the way, you know, remember, it's going to be a cakewalk. Remember that it, I hope some of you in this room do that the Iraq invasion, you know, it was like, it's going to be easy. They're going to welcome us as liberators. So they're going to give us, throw candy and flowers. I mean, I could give you a whole line of quotes from the Bush administration. I remember thinking, this is so fucked up. I can't believe these people believe this. And they did believe it. A lot of them did believe it. So I think it's possible that there are people in the Kremlin who think there are a lot of sympathetic people in Ukraine who are going to come to our support. And I think it's, they're going to be surprised about that. The questions? There we go. Now it's on. Yeah. Um, no, this is really fascinating. Um, I'm just curious to know what your perspective is, because I feel like, again, with Putin using terms like denazification, I feel like he's just like, this is like almost an old school war he wants with like a new, because we're in a new age. And so my question is, what do you think this is supposed to be? Because I'm also just interested in like the whole deep fake misinformation campaign that has come out of Russia and how that could potentially be used in this new age. Because this is, again, this feels like a very old school war to me. And I feel like yeah. he's trying to want to go back to the glory days of, you know, that's yeah. how he, that's how Putin is. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, Chris, right? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, you not only see this new disinformation world, you see the attempts, and this to me is most fascinating, to counter it by the Americans and the West. I mean, there has been this steady attempt to say, no, they're doing this. No, they're doing that. Whatever they say, they're doing X. I mean, you see every time they try an information operation, for example, they're committing, you know, the Ukraine, Ukrainians are committing genocide against Russian speaking Ukrainians. You know, immediately the administration comes up and says that, and this is gonna be a, a ploy. So you're seeing both information operations on one side and attempts to combat them on the other. And it's really interesting, especially for journalists, because we're kind of in the middle of that. You know, um, you don't want to be used by the American government. But on the other hand, the Americans essentially, are, they're also using propaganda. I mean, it is prop propaganda, but it happens to be true from the American side. Uh, and propaganda can be true. In fact, the most effective propaganda tends to be true. Um, so the Russians tend to be lying about most of this. The Americans tend, at least at this point, to be telling the truth, and they are trying to get that out as much as they can. I mean, there's a whole other aspect of this, which is, will the Russians try to you know, bring down the internet in Ukraine? I think that's likely. I think we'll see that happen. Um, uh, will they launch cyber attacks against Western Europe? Will they launch cyber attacks against the United States? Uh, what role will cyber play? I think we don't, uh, we don't really know that yet. But that is partly included in your question, that there's this whole, on the one hand, you have old school warfare. I mean, we're looking at maps that show arrows and armored columns and airborne troops seizing airports. I mean, all of this is like warfare 101, right? And, but then you have this, you know, there also always was information warfare too, but you just have a higher level of it now, partly because of the internet and partly because the Russians have just adopted this since uh, 2000, whatever, sometime in the early 2000s, they have basically reinvigorated their military. And this happened under Putin. And they've become much more of a high tech military, much more dependent on cyber, uh, modernized volunteers, uh, elite forces, um, and uh, this use of information warfare is much more sophisticated than it was. And uh, the Chinese also much more sophisticated than it was. So we're seeing here a kind of modern level of warfare combined with, as you say, old school. And the combination of it is really interesting, partly because we can't see it all. You know, we have to, and that's part of the reason why we have to be really active consumers uh, of the news. You know, we have to watch and, you know, who's, who is this story benefiting? Where is it coming from? If it's from a blind source, where might that be, right? Is the White House putting this out? Why? 
you know, is the intelligence, uh, Western intelligence agencies, why? It, where is this coming from? And, uh, you know, one of the things that we've had nothing about is disposition of Ukrainian forces. It's as if they don't exist. And we don't know where the fighting is going. And it, that's, I assume that's partly because the Pentagon and Western intelligence agencies are just completely mum on that. And we might, we will start to have that opening up a little, but it will be very much inflected, right, in favor of the pro-Ukrainian story. That's just kind of the way it works. And so we're going to be, it's really important we get good reporting from the ground. And, you know, I saw somebody on CNN yesterday describing, or no, it's NPR, describing fleeing from Kharkiv uh, to Lvov. And sort of, she was, you know, saying how, she's very experienced foreign correspondent, but saying, I had to make a decision. If I stayed here, would I be able to move? Or should I move? And she decided to move. And I thought, Eleanor Beardsley, and I thought, um, shit, you know, I mean, that's too bad. I, I would rather have her in Kharkiv. But people have to make these decisions on the ground. And, you know, actual movement gets difficult. The roads get snarled because of the uh, uh, movements of refugees. So, you know, you don't have a helicopter. You, you just, you're dependent on the same roads that the refugees are. Um, other questions? Yeah. Um, so this question is actually related a little bit to what Chris asked and kind of what you touched upon. But for the past like 24 or 12 hours, I've watched videos of Russian tanks, Ukrainian troops, source material coming from what I believe is Ukraine on social media. And I'm really curious, what role is social media going to play in this? And with the increasing sophisticated use of organizing on social media, how do you see that playing out for Russia, Ukraine, and Europe at like a larger extent? Well, it's a, it's a great question. And I hate to say it, but part of the answer is we're gonna see. You know, it, I think your uh, premise is absolutely correct. Social media is gonna be extremely important and we're gonna see it in the organization. I mean, first of all, in the attempts by Putin, first and foremost, to convince his country that this is in their interest, right? That's going to be uh, the beginning. Ooh, where's that from? Uh, so this is called Snap Maps. Uh -huh. It's publicly available, publicly posted Snapchats, and you can just get on there and see what people are posting. Basically. There we go. Yeah. Then, right. Yeah. So then this. It's nice too is that it's really hard. Like on Snapchat, it's really hard to like post. On on Snapchat, it's really it's. On Snapchat, it's really hard to post anything other than what's coming out of your camera. It's possible, but it's not super intuitive. And so it's a good way if you just want to see for yourself what mm -hmm. the average Ukrainian is posting to get on there. You know, obviously verify it or whatever else if you're going to like report it, but for your own eyes, it's yeah. great. Yeah, I think there's obviously we should have a blanket sort of watch out when it comes to reporting this stuff because there's a whole level of, you know, authenticating that also we're kind of in a new world, you know, of how to authenticate things. But what I was gonna say is right now, social media, Putin has a major problem, which is to convince the Russians that this was a good idea. So that's, there's gonna be a lot of social media, you know, trying to do that. Second level is we're gonna get a lot of stuff like this. Here are the Russians coming in. This is what they look like. And it'll be interesting to see how the Russians react to that. Uh, you know, in, in Iraq at a certain point, if somebody, if troops left a base, American troops left a base and somebody picked up a cell phone like this, they'd get shot. And, you know, people here had no idea of this, but, but you know, it was like, no, don't do that. I mean, obviously part of it was IEDs and part of it was, you know, calling their position, but it'll be interesting to see how Russians respond to that. In Syria, eventually, People would drive around in cars and, you know, you'd put a piece of plywood in the back window of your car with a pin with a uh, hole and you'd film that way. So we may have that kind of development going on, but definitely get on YouTube, get on social media, Snapchat. Um, you're going to get start to get a whole avalanche of stuff. Using it re for reporting is another matter altogether. Um, I'm not sure whether, you know, you have the problem of authenticating it, obviously. 
Yeah, we have a question in the chat. What needs to happen at what stage of the war do we expect NATO, US, EU countries to get involved directly? At no stage. I, don't, I think that it's one of the sadnesses at the present moment. I mean, I say sadness, you know, I'm, I'm quite torn about this, that it was treated as a foregone conclusion that the United States and NATO, if Putin did this, would not act. Now, am I saying the US should be fighting in Ukraine? No, I'm not. But I am saying that the United States, perhaps, if this had worked out diplomatically differently, and if it left that on the table, uh, that it was possible that it would get involved, I think the outcome might have been different. I mean, don't take me at my word, this is a very complicated issue, but I think at the moment, the EU, uh, certainly NATO, is not gonna get involved in Ukraine. I think uh, if fighting goes over the border into Poland, it will get involved. There's you know, something called Article 5, which basically says an attack on any NATO country is an attack on all. So all of these, you know, we've essentially created this two-tier NATO where we have core countries, and then we have these countries on the Russian border, uh, like the Baltics, which, as I said earlier, are basically militarily very difficult to defend, and, but we're committed to defending them. And one of my objections in 94 to, the, to creating this situation was we're creating a two-tier NATO and we're going to hollow out Article 5, basically. And I think that this is what's evolving in front of us. We're kind of seeing a little bit of that. I hope it doesn't continue. But I think that it, we're not going to see American troops fighting in Ukraine. It may well be that we will see a lot of supplies coming from the West and even CIA, I mean, it depends how the, uh, I mean, US intelligence agencies and the Pentagon may decide this is the way to bleed Russia as they did in, when it came to the Soviet Union and Afghanistan, right? They, they armed the Mujahideen. We know how that turned out. <laughs> law, of, law of unforeseen consequences. Okay, uh, sure. And then, oh, sorry, we'll go to you next. John? Um, so I just wanted to ask, I think one of the things that we're seeing in the news quite a bit right now is uh, talk of economic sanctions and actually use of economic sanctions, right. um, careful use of economic sanctions. I think, you know, Biden has been quite careful about spiking oil prices, which is, mm -hmm. I think, 45% of, of Russia's exports. Right. Uh, At least. I think it's higher. And how, how effective do you expect economic sanctions to be in this war? And, and maybe war is a strong term for right now? And uh, what other modes of deterrence do you see us using? That's a great question. Um, it's, it's really too early to tell. I mean, obviously, the first task of the sanctions, which was to deter this, failed. And you saw the president yesterday saying, well, th this wasn't about deterrence, which is crap. You know, they, they did want it to deter it. That's why they didn't impose them a week ago. They wanted to deter, and that failed. And I don't think anybody really believed it was going to deter him from doing anything, but they thought it might deter him from doing the biggest thing. Um, so that failed. Uh, the sanctions will take a while. The current ones that they just imposed will take, a, first of all, they haven't imposed everything they could. There's the SWIFT system, the banking system, which they have, because of the objections of the Europeans, they haven't uh, uh, isolated Russia from which they could still do, presumably. And they haven't sanctioned the oil sector, which, you know, as you just pointed out, is the key to the Russian economy. However, it's also key to the European economy. So there's an inherent paradox when it comes to sanctions, which is that Europe is dependent on Russian exports of gas, of natural gas. And uh, that makes the whole sanction situation uh, very difficult. On the other hand, I think if this goes on long enough, the sanctions will start to bite and they will be a factor in Putin's uh, uh, decision-making. They will not be the complete, I mean, it won't be, oh, sanctions are biting, I've got to stop this war. It'll never be that, but it will be one of the incentives that lead him to end it. Um, I think a bigger incentive would be if there's significant opposition at home. I think that's really something to watch for. 
that if you see more demonstrations and you see the regime looking like it's fragile, that will be an extremely important thing. That this, you know, this wouldn't be the first invasion that led to a revolution at home. In fact, World War I led to the Russian Revolution. Uh, so, you know, military stresses can then translate into domestic politics. So that is something I would really uh, watch for. But I think sanctions, you know, there may be another tranche is the term of art that they lay on, but I don't think it will be a de determinative factor, in my opinion. This will be the last one. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. I mean, if somebody else has their, you know, we could, as far as I'm concerned, go on a couple. Yeah, go ahead. In the last few hours, oh, thanks. <laughs> In the last few hours, European leaders um, were talking with the foreign minister of Ukraine about approving the ban from uh, from the SWIFT. Right. So what, what should we expect if Russia will actually be banned from this? Uh, from you know, SWIFT? I, I don't know. People seem to disagree on how effective that is. There are uh, some people who claim that if you don't ban them from SWIFT, you're not serious at the end of the day, that that is, a, is just a critical part. I mean, you see various uh, uh, people in the US now saying, no, no, you know, the, the uh, sanctions on the banks are big enough. Um, it is clear that this is a kind of dividing line between the US and Europe. And uh, I think one of the things it'll show, regardless of what the actual you know, effect is, is it'll show the Europeans are coming over to the American view of how important this is. And that will be uh, a useful sign because I think you know, you're having a period of shock in Europe right now. I think that this is, I said this at the very beginning today that you know, sometimes there's 9-11 and there's an attack and there it's happened. Sometimes it's a little slower and I think that the general level of shock over the next few days, especially after you see Kiev occupied, if that's what happens, is uh, going to grow. And as you see, you know, 137 Ukrainians dead yesterday, it could be 1,000 tomorrow. And when you start seeing that, I think the effect in Europe is going to be uh, large. And Germany in particular, which is the key, the key player in European politics, and has been the most resistant and not surprisingly, not coincidentally, has the biggest trade relationship with Russia. So, you know, they are in a different position than the US is. Their relationship, you know, when they impose sanctions, it hurts them in a way, it hurts them, the Europeans, in a way it doesn't hurt us because our trade relationship is much uh, uh, slimmer. Um, so it'll show, uh, my answer is, the SWIFT thing seems important from my point of view because it'll show the seriousness of the situation and how serious the Europeans are taking it. And it'll also put the US and the Europeans very much on the same, in the same boat, which they're not at the moment. Um, you can keep going, I thought there was a vent afterwards. Yeah, I'm <laughs> happy to take questions. Okay, um, I just want to know how critical China's involvement. How, I'm sorry, say it again. How critical China is. China's involvement in, in the current, or silence, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, question. Um, China, I mean, you know, it's a very fashionable uh, thing now in foreign policy circles to talk about the triangular relationship. That's the United States, Russia, and China. And it was the original triangular diplomacy is originally what Kissinger and Nixon played off when Kissinger you know, flew to Beijing, or Nixon flew to Beijing, they sort of broke up uh, this triangular relationship and brought China over to the side of the United States. And what people in the foreign policy community have been saying, look, we're in a situation now where uh, Putin and Xi are together, right? They're collaborating against the United States. And it's the one situation you don't want and what hasn't really been uh, uh, the truth of the situation since the end of the Cold War. I mean, they've been getting closer and closer, but this is now almost a collaboration. 
Now, having said that, I think China, by its diplomatic pronouncements or its lack of diplomatic pronouncements, I suspect they were a little surprised that he went, I'm not sure that they were informed that he was going to go big in the way he has. Um, they've been, you know, conspicuously silent over the last day or so. Um, because they're in, on the one hand, uh, geo geostrategically, they're in an interesting position because they're looking at the United States and how it will respond. They have a similar issue when it comes to Taiwan, right? This Taiwan, the United States has supposedly guaranteed its independence, although it doesn't say this explicitly. And they want to, they have a certain window where they might be able to take Taiwan militarily. So they're looking very close to the, closely at the United States and its response. And the United States also is thinking of the implications for Taiwan. On the other hand, the, the Chinese very much do not wanna be sort of uh, exiled from the world system. They don't wanna be a pariah, which is what Putin is going to be in the next week or so. You're gonna see this effort to just make him into the evil person who will not play by the rules-based, keep this phrase in mind, the rules-based international order. And China wants to be part of that rules-based international order. Uh, you know, our relationship with China is very different from our relationship with Russia. Uh, with China, it's largely an economic relationship. It has geostrategic aspects. I mentioned Taiwan uh, and the South China Sea but it's also very highly an economic relationship. With Russia, there isn't the economic relationship. It's simply what's going on uh, geostrategically in Europe. So I think, you know, to get back to your original question, I think we're yet to, I mean, thus far, China has seemed to be on board with what Putin was going to do. It did not condemn Putin at the Security Council the other night. Um, it basically said, let diplomacy play out, give peace a chance, yada, yada, yada. Um, and it hasn't, you know, very obviously condemned him yet. Um, but, and it also, Russia is clearly counting on China to be its bulwark against sanctions, something I should have said right at the beginning. And how much that will be true or not is another question. For example, if somehow the Europeans were to get natural gas from Qatar, for example, uh, uh, which the US is clearly trying to work, would the Russians be able to sell all of its petrochemical stuff to the Chinese? They're, they're sort of assuming that. Whether it turns out to be true or not, I don't know. So anyway, I'm sorry not to give you a clearer answer, but the fact is that uh, uh, it's one of the things that's going to evolve. I mean, at the moment, they seem to be the bulwark of Russia in undertaking this sort of, you know, Russia's savior. Uh, but I think that uh, they don't want to be exposed as a pariah state, and I think that might you might see uh, you might see the consequences of that. I may be too optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for thanks for doing this. It's been really helpful. Um, Great. So you said earlier that. Um, you know, discord in Russia might actually be more, you know, successful or helpful than, you know, the sanctions in, you know, convincing Russia to back off. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you think we'll, you know, see the CIA roll out its old playbook and like try to show that discord, like the Russians tried to do, you know, for the 2016 election, you know, on Facebook. And if so, how effective you think that will be and whether it will sort of further the escalatory ladder between us and Russia? Like, could we see cyber attacks in response, more IRA stuff, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, as it is, you know, the Russians hated Hillary Clinton because they thought she was supporting, you know, the last time you had a sort of semi-national uprising uh, in Russia. And I think that, yeah, our intelligence services, US intelligence services and European ones, uh, if they're doing their jobs, will indeed try to help escalate this. I mean, there's a, it's a very delicate matter because essentially in situations like this, the Russians point to the opposition and say, they're CIA stooges, right? They did that in Ukraine. 
right, in 2014. This is all CIA. That was a CIA uh, coup. And, you know, the fact is that there's some truth to that. I mean, the West definitely helped. And the trick is to sort of not be caught. You know, first of all, you can't just do it yourself. You know, it has to be real. I mean, the days of doing a coup like the CIA did in 1953 in um, uh, Iran and 1954 in Guatemala, I think those days are kind of done. You know, it has to be a real domestic movement. But I think the CIA, if it if it's doing its job, will be will be involved in that. And whether uh, you know it will be a question of supplying things on the ground. I mean, they'll, remember there are two aspects here. Uh, one is a, a sort of citizens uprising. You know, demonstrations, people out on the street, and uh, to do that you need to sort of facilitate communications, you need to keep the internet up, things like that. Then there's an uprising of some kind and that you can get involved with arms, communications gear and other things. So the question is, what exactly are we talking about? In Ukraine, I think depending on how this goes, there will be a movement to supply clandestine equipment and arms to the Ukrainian resistance. And this is something, as you point out, the CIA has been doing since the late 40s, uh, not very successfully, by the way. Uh, so we hope they're more successful in this case. Um, I think that'll start to happen. To what degree they do, you know, they help social media, they do things like that, I don't know. I mean, is, that could be one of these things that you think, I'm sure they're all over that. In fact, they suck at it. That's, that's quite possible. Uh, I, just, I just don't know. Um, uh, we may find, you know, if I were a national security reporter at the Washington Post, say, this is, I'd be on this now, you know, I'd be trying to find out what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? Of course, you know, you're only going to find out if they want you to know something that people, readers of newspapers often forget, you know, the idea of leaks. Oh, they got a leak. Usually the leak is purposeful, you know, it's, it's intended. And, um, uh, so it's going to give you a picture that, by definition, is more positive than the truth might be. So this is a very slippery area of reporting. Um, but I think the general premise of your question is quite correct. I think that uh, intelligence agencies will, will, will be involved, especially if this goes on a long time. Um, uh, you know, I hope they'll make things better rather than worse. Um, you know, we'll see. I mean, I think there's probably going to be a period of real bitterness in Ukraine uh, when a lot of people start dying. There's going to be a period of real bitterness against the West. You know, I, I reported during the Balkan Wars, and when you first went to Bosnia, they loved you. Western reporters, you know, get our story out. Look how horrible it is. We're dying on the streets. Look at these snipers. Look at that body. After a year, they didn't like you so much. Because the cavalry didn't come, you know. So um, from a reporter's point of view, things may get difficult there before they get better. That was a good question. Any any other? Hey. Hey, um, <laughs> Laura. <laughs> nice, nice to see you. Uh, yeah, I just had reread your interview with uh, Avanitsky, the filmmaker from Winter on Fire. Oh, right. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. For Telluride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he ends the interview. It's a, it's a film about uh, the Maiden 2014. It's a great film. What's it called? Win Winter on Fire. Winter on Fire. Highly recommend it. Highly, highly. You want to know about what's going on there? Watch that film. Yeah, it's on Netflix. Um, he ends the interview saying that Maiden had won. And I was just curious what your foresight on during that interview was. And if you had any arguments against what he said at that time. You know, God, I'm so torn about this. You know, it's weird when your life, your life stretches out and suddenly you can see the consequences of things that happened 30 years before. Do you know, it's, it's a very weird feeling. It, it, the only way you can feel it is to feel it. And that's what I start to see. And I thought, as I said at the beginning, expansion of NATO was a terrible idea. And of course, there's no way to say what would have happened if it hadn't expanded. Um, but I thought it was a terrible idea. And I thought basically saying to uh, Ukraine, you're going to eventually be in NATO 
was a terrible idea because I thought, you know, Putin explicitly said, we will not tolerate this. He used the word tolerate. And he basically said, if you do that, I'm not going to put up with it. And so, you know, to me, it's very bitter sitting here and watching these people die. Because do we have any obligation? You know, we, we certainly have a responsibility for it happening. There's no question in my mind that our leaving open NATO membership for Ukraine has partly resulted in this. I don't think it's the only reason. I think, you know, Putin is an empire builder. He wants to reconstitute the Soviet empire. There are lots of, you know, we shouldn't tear our garments and say, oh my God, we did this. But we do have some responsibility. And I could feel it and, you know, I was excited by that film and the made and what happened there. I mean, I encourage everybody to watch the film. It was extremely exciting. These revolutions are extremely exciting. You know, my friend George Soros has kind of promoted these. He's the great boogeyman now in, in Eastern Europe because he promoted these, because he believes in the open society. And he's very staunch in that regard. And I'm in some ways much more of a realist. You know, I think, shit, if we tell them this, what's gonna happen? Some of them are gonna get killed. And we're seeing that happen. Now, you know, maybe, they'll, maybe this will be the end of Putin. It's quite possible, I think. Uh, maybe it'll end with Ukraine part of NATO and Russia a democracy. The one thing I've certainly learned in my adult life is you can't predict these things. It's just, there are too many factors. You know, as Tolstoy pointed out a long time ago, I mean, there's just too many factors in history. Um, but to go back to your question, yeah, when I was interviewing him, I felt very torn. Because on the one hand, you want to be behind these Ukrainians, these brave Ukrainians. I and mean, that was an amazing revolution. And the film shows it in great uh, detail, beautiful detail. And um, I want to be behind them now. But I also am very uh, conscious that the US has a history of saying rah, rah, rah. It said rah, rah, rah to the Hungarians in 1956. The Russians came in and massacred them. It said rah, rah, rah to the Czechs in 68. The Russians came in and massacred them. You know, watch, um, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, Phil Kaufman's movie based on the Kundera novel. Um, the Unbearable Lightness of Being, another great film. Uh, sexy film too, recommend it. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we have a history of doing this. Freedom, freedom. And then when the dying starts, we're not there. You know, and is that a good thing? I don't know. I'm, I'm really torn about whether that's a good thing. Because on the one hand, you look at places. I mean, hun the Hungarians are, well, <laughs> Hungary is not a very good example. I mean, they now have an autocracy, you know. Um, but they did indeed become free and the Czechs are free and the Slovaks. Uh, so uh, George Kennan was right, you know, not just about war, but about history in general, that uh, you know where you begin, you don't know where you end. And boy, this is a demonstration of that. Yeah, so uh, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg said that a cyber attack on a member state could trigger, or a cyber attack on a member state could trigger Article 5. I'm curious to know what you make of that, especially given reports of ransomware attacks on NVIDIA, maybe British Airways. And then- What was the first one before British Airways? NVIDIA, the chip maker. Uh -huh. And, and um, I'm also curious, what do you see the, the world of possibilities possibly happening around cyber attacks going forward? Gosh, these are great. You guys are answering really good questions and that's a, that's a great one. Um, I, and I hate to say it, my answer again is I don't know because this is an un, uh, uh, I mean, this is just a new world we're in, particularly when it comes to cyber attacks. I mean, I'm very, when did Stoltenberg say that today? I'm, I'm kind of shocked he would say that because I can't believe the member states of NATO agree with that. You know, in other words, there's gonna be a cyber attack on Poland and there's gonna be a, was the implication there's gonna be an armed response? He said that, I mean, he said it could trigger Article 5 and the NATO response and that's the fact. 
Yeah. In other words, he could be suggesting that a cyber attack would respond from NATO, I suppose. Um, you know, we're in a new world here. I mean, the whole world of cyber is, is deeply complicated. And, uh, you know, the Russians have launched various attacks, not just cyber attacks where they shut things down, but obviously interference in the election and so on, which was a very real thing. I mean, it was a very significant thing they did, regardless of what Trump said and so on, um, with apparently little response from the United States, which when I say apparently, I want to emphasize, we don't know. Uh, because the responders, which is the people at Fort Meade at the NSA, have an interest in not publicizing it. And the targets, the Russians, have an interest in not publicizing it. So were there responses that actually did things? I don't know. And I think we don't know. Um, so this area, it's a, it's a brilliant question, but I think this is one of the things we're gonna find out in the next few weeks, or we won't find out. Do you know what I mean? That, that the, the, it's interesting that the amount we actually find out about this war may at the one time seem enormous. We may get all these videos and all the stuff on the ground. And if you get online, you can see it happening. And at the same time, there's a kind of beneath the sea part of the iceberg, uh, which we don't really know about at all. And I just renew my plea, which is that in reading the reporting, um, you know, I would go make sure you go to standard places that have good reputations, the so-called elite media, start with that and ask yourself when things come from the CIA, when things come about cyber, for example, where is it coming from? What are the interests involved? It doesn't mean it's gonna be false. It just means you're being played almost by definition because that stuff gets in the press because someone picks up the phone and calls a reporter. That's how it gets in the press. So uh, usually there's a reason for that. Doesn't mean it's false, but it does mean, you know, you probably aren't getting the whole story. Um, but I think it will play, you know, to go back to the question, I think it'll play an increasing part. And I'm amazed that Stoltenberg said that, that strikes me as a very bold, you know, uncharacteristically bold statement. So we'll see. Anyway, you guys, thank you. Excellent questions. It's a pleasure talking to you today. We'll keep watching. Thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate you. Thank you everyone for being so engaged and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everybody, and thank those online.